To receive credit for a certificate of completion for ticket dismissal and or an insurance discount, you must complete the registration process at wirelessdefensivedriving.com as required by the Texas Education Agency. You may continue to access this information for entertainment purposes only, but unless you register, you will not receive credit or a certificate for insurance or ticket dismissal. The following presentation is brought to you by wirelessdefensivedriving.com. Hello, traffic offenders, and welcome back to wirelessdefensivedriving.com, the course you can take anywhere, anytime. Oh, wait, I already told you that. I'm your announcer, microphone, and now, live from the Terabyte Theater in downtown cyberspace, here's your host, Chuck Sheffield. Welcome back, traffic offenders and panelists, and hello, Mike. How are you today? I'm just great, Chuck, but I, I'm realizing something. Unless I'm mistaken, this is the last unit of the course. Indeed it is, Mike. And although I'm sad to be parting company with our great panelists, I'm glad to be helping people drive more safely, reducing insurance costs, and keeping the highways and byways safe. Right you are, Chuck. How about introducing the panelists one last time? It would be my pleasure to introduce them, starting with Mr. Tony Ramirez. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Kathy Whiteman. So glad to be here. And we're glad to have you. And last but not least, Judy Truesdale. Hello, and how in the world are you? I could complain, but no one would listen. So, <laughs> are you three ready to put this thing to bed? We are, mm -hmm. Chuck, and I'm glad that we are finally going to be devoting some time to a very important aspect of driving safely, drugs and alcohol. That's our topic indeed, and you're right, it is very important because millions of people take drugs every day and don't realize they can affect their driving. Alcohol, tranquilizers, marijuana, or any other drug can affect the mental and physical skills needed to drive. Not just illegal or prescription drugs, over-the-counter meds can affect driving skills too. Oh, I'm seriously knocked out if I try to take a cold medication, even an over-the-counter. Well, let's look at some national traffic stats related to alcohol. In the year 2012, for example, there were 33,561 drunken driving deaths, which was, unfortunately, a 4.6% increase from the previous year's alcohol-related driving deaths. Did any of those crashes involve drivers with a BAC over the .08 limit? The majority of those crashes involved drivers with a blood alcohol concentration of .15 or higher, nearly double the legal limit. Mm, pretty sobering. Yeah, <laughs> pun intended, I'm sure. Here's more. 1,140 children ages 14 and younger died as occupants in their car accidents in 2011. Of those deaths, 181, or about 16%, were the direct result of drunken drivers. What about people who weren't in cars? You mean like pedestrians? Or bicyclists. Did those fatalities increase or decrease? Well, fatalities among pedestrians increased for the third consecutive year by 6.4% in 2011. My dad always tells my daughter that nothing good can happen on the road after midnight. Yeah, he's kind of right. Nighttime drivers were four times more likely to die in drunk driving crashes than those driving during the daytime. And drivers involved in fatal crashes were twice as likely to be alcohol impaired on weekends, 31%, than during the week at 16%. Twice as likely? Wow. Pretty staggering. Again, no pun intended. <laughs> and this is no laughing matter. And the 21 to 24 age group accounted for 35% of all alcohol impaired drivers who died in accidents in 2011 the highest of all age groups. It makes me want to lock my daughter's car in the garage and throw away the keys. I mean, she's a responsible driver, but many people aren't. That's for sure. Unfortunately, the younger drivers are the ones at the most risk. Despite being under the legal drinking age, 32% of drivers age 15 to 20 who were killed in motor vehicle crashes in 2011 had been drinking some amount of alcohol. 26% were alcohol impaired. American teens from the ages of 15 to 20 were more likely to be killed while driving under the influence than adults ages 55 to 64. Okay, I hate to bring this up, but since I have two driving age sons, can we talk about teenage drinking and driving? Well, sure. Number one killer of teenagers, driving under the influence. More than 4,000 teens are killed and another 110,000 are seriously injured each year in car crashes involving alcohol in Texas. Does that include only drivers or were they all drinking? No to both. In fact, not all of them were drinking. In some cases, they were passengers or targets of people who drink and drive. In high school, 
of 475 students, two are likely to be killed or injured in drunk driving crashes. Okay, that makes me want to go home and do a random blood test on my boys. <laughs> no I sure don't want them to be the two. What about seat belts? Have they brought down the numbers at all? Well, of the drunk driving crashes where seat belt use was known, nearly 75% of all drunk drivers killed in accidents weren't wearing seat belts. Can we talk about the whole legally intoxicated issue? I have a problem with this because I really think if anybody's been drinking at all, they shouldn't be driving. A lot of people feel that way, but a standard has been set. In the U.S., a blood alcohol concentration level of .08 or higher is considered above the legal limit in nearly every state. The most frequently recorded BAC level among drivers is... Um, wait, what does BAC stand for? Blood alcohol concentration. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. The most frequently recorded BAC level among drivers in fatal crashes was .17, more than twice the legal limit. That is awful. Across all age groups, male drivers in fatal crashes were more likely than females to have been alcohol impaired. Over 25% of male drivers and 14% of female drivers were alcohol impaired. What about motorcycles? Better? Worse? Worse. Uh -huh. In 2011, it was more dangerous to drive drunk on a motorcycle than any other vehicle. Motorcycle riders had the highest rate of alcohol impairment, 29%, and large truck drivers, 2%, the lowest rate of alcohol impairment. That doesn't surprise me. So, who can answer this? Driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs was a contributing factor in what percent of crashes? Half, 50%. No. Oh, this is just crashes in general, right? Not fatalities? Well, we'll get to fatalities in a minute. No, this is just all kinds of crashes. I could guess, but it would just be a guess. 8%. Mm -hmm. However, alcohol or drugs accounted for 28% of all fatal crashes in Texas. So wait, alcohol was involved in 8% of all crashes, but 28% of all wrecks with fatalities in Texas? That's right. How does Texas stack up as far as having driving under the influence deaths compared to other states? Well, I'm sorry to report that Texas has edged out California once again as the state with the most alcohol-related motor vehicle fatalities and the highest number of fatalities with drivers over the .08% legal limit. That can't be good. How bad is it? Let's look at it. This is for Texas in 2012 now. We had 25,755 alcohol-related crashes. 9,458 people were seriously injured in alcohol-related crashes, and there were 1,170 people killed in an alcohol-related crash. Well, that's a lot of numbers, but how does it relate to me? Okay, now how's this? Alcohol is a factor in almost four of every ten work-related traffic crashes. Seventy, seventy Texans are killed or injured in alcohol-related crashes every day. There's an alcohol-related crash in Texas every 20 minutes. Almost half, 49.6% of all fatal crashes in Texas involve alcohol. Well, that really brings it home. I'm never drinking and driving again, not even one glass of wine. All right, now let's talk about the physiological effects of alcohol. We're going to go back to biology class for a few minutes. Judy, can you tell me how alcohol is primarily absorbed? Well, I'm guessing you don't mean through the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I do know this. Alcohol is absorbed through the stomach and the small intestines. It's considered a food because it has calories but doesn't need to be digested. It just goes straight to the body through the digestive system. That's right. After it's ingested, it's carried through the bloodstream and crosses the blood-brain barrier, and that's when impairment begins. Right, and the more you drink, the more your brain is impaired, and you have a harder time doing things like walking along, finding your keys, remembering which car is yours. <laughs> yes, <laughs> a more difficult time functioning. Now, regarding metabolism and eliminating the alcohol out of the body, who knows how the majority of alcohol is eliminated from the body? Well, I know, um, wait, I think, is it the liver? Yes, ma'am. 90% is eliminated through the body while 10% is eliminated unchanged through sweat and urine. Before the liver can process alcohol, a threshold amount is needed and can occur at the rate of one 12-ounce can of beer, one 5-ounce glass of wine, or one 1.5-ounce one shot of whiskey per hour. Well, that's interesting. I didn't realize there was that much difference in kinds of alcohol. There is. Alcohol begins to affect people prior to reaching the legally intoxicated BAC level of 0.08%. Say, if a 150-pound person, for instance, drinks one drink equal to 12 ounces of beer at 5% alcohol, 5 ounces of wine, 12% alcohol, or 1.5 ounces of hard liquor, 
40% alcohol, all would contain about the same amount of alcohol and would raise the person's blood alcohol concentration about 0.02%. It takes the liver approximately one hour to oxidize or metabolize one drink. No wonder it's a good idea to sit for a while after you've had something to drink. Indeed, it's a very good idea. Now, let's talk about the stages of intoxication. Because when someone drinks alcohol, there are definite visible changes in their performance and behavior. An increase in a person's blood alcohol content can be tracked in five stages. What's the first one? I don't know what you would call it, but my drinking companions, <laughs> well, not me, of course, oh, no. No. feel more confident and daring. That's right. It's called euphoria. Their BAC is only 0 0.01 to 0.12 percent, but they think they're pretty cool. Now, what other characteristics do they exhibit? Uh, anyone? They get flushed. You know, their face gets red. Yes, and they have trouble paying attention. Uh -huh. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What did you say? No, very <laughs> funny. Uh -huh. <laughs> what else? Um, let's see. Hmm, they're more talkative. Okay. No, not exactly. Oh, well, that could be a way they display confidence, which we've already said. All right, there are two more. Anyone uh -huh. have a guess? Uh, I don't think I do. Oh, wait. Fine motor control is harder, like they can't fumble up their wallets and get their credit card out, and so they stick me with the tab. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> they find tasks requiring fine motor control difficult. One more. Anybody? Uh, no, I got nothing. Mm, me neither. All right. They lack good judgment, mm, and uh, they act on impulse. That uh, makes sense. Mm -hmm. They act on impulse and order another round. <laughs> exactly. Right. Okay. The second stage, which we call excitement. The drinker has a BAC of 0 0.09 to 0.25 percent. And how might he behave? He gets sleepy. Well, sometimes. What else? He has uh, trouble with short-term memory and bad reaction time. Both right. How else are they impaired? Gross motor skills are uncoordinated, meaning they spill drinks and somebody says, ooh, gross. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Okay, gross motor skills like arms and legs. Yes, they have trouble balancing. Now, what about their senses in the excitement stage? I would think things are starting to become a little blurry, uh -huh. and all the senses become dull. Hearing, tasting, touch, nothing's working right. All of those are right, and all of those would make a good driver call a cab. Unfortunately, however, some drivers keep drinking. Moving on to the confusion stage, with a blood alcohol concentration of 0.18 to 0.30. How does this genius behave? He might not know where he is or what he is doing, and he may be finding it difficult to walk. Hey, hey, hey. how come this is a he? I bet plenty <laughs> of ladies have passed the point of no return at the bar. Oh. Now, let's, let's, all right, let's just say he or she may start to have emotions that run high. He or she may become aggressive, uh, withdrawn, or very affectionate. I think vision is really blurry now, and he is very sleepy. And isn't there something about pain being dulled at this point, like you could practically slam your finger in a car door and it wouldn't hurt? It might not be as dramatic as that, but you're right. Pain is dulled. Now, our guy, or gal, at the bar has a blood alcohol concentration of 0.25 to 0.49. We call this stage stupor. And how does it look? I would say the lady can barely move. She doesn't respond to external stimuli. She can't walk or stand. And she may, well, you know, puke. So now it's a girl. <laughs> he or she. <laughs> he may vomit repeatedly and become unconscious. Pass out on the floor. And I know none of you have ever gone that mm. far. No, mm -hmm. sir. No, we have not. Let's move on to the next stage. And, and is this the last one, I hope? It is, and we like to call it coma stage. The genius drunk has a BAC of 0.35 to 0 0.50. And how does he or she look? With that much alcohol in his system, I'm going to say that this guy is down for the count, unconscious. This can really be serious. In fact... Death can occur. The pupils don't respond to light. The body temperature is lower than normal. Breathing is shallow and pulse rate is slow. I've had a drink or two in my life, but I can honestly say I've never been that messed up. Me either, not even in my club days. Or me in my mosh pit days. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Okay. It's time for a little multiple choosing. You up for a panel? I am. This is getting a little heavy-handed. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's lighten things up then. Even though this is serious subject matter, we're going to talk now about driver performance. As you no doubt know, panel, impairment of the most important driving skills can occur at very low BAC. Which of these skills can be adversely affected by low level of alcohol consumption? A. Psychomotor skills. B. Vision. C. Perception. D. Tracking or steering or E, all of the above. 
Finally, an E, all of the above question. Yay. E is the answer. Yeah, and that is right. Also, information processing and attention. All of these functions are impaired by alcohol, although they differ in the extent of their impairment at any given BAC. Okay, next question. The brain's control of what is highly vulnerable to alcohol? A, eye movements. B, ability to remember one's ATM password. <laughs> C, the words to who let the dogs out. Oh, whoa, wait. <laughs> you did not just say the title of who let the dogs out, please. <laughs> A is the correct answer. Oh, you're right. I hope the next drink I take removes all traces of who let the dogs out from my mind. Where's the love? This is a tender, meaningful song. That, yeah. Right you are. All right. When he's behind the wheel, the driver's eyes must focus briefly on important objects in the visual field and track them as they and the car move. And this is tricky. Low to moderate BACs of maybe 0.03 to 0.05% interfere with voluntary eye movements, impairing the eye's ability to rapidly track a moving target. Okay, next question. Significant impairment in what ability may begin as low as 0.035% BAC and rises as the BAC increases? A, steering ability. B, ability to sing along the radio. C, ability to remember your mother's birthday. <laughs> Chuck, you are just getting silly, and this is serious subject matter, but the answer is A, steering ability. The line between lighthearted and silly is a fine one, but you're right. <laughs> <clears throat> a was the right answer. And what about this? Alcohol-impaired drivers require more time to read a street sign or respond to a traffic signal than unimpaired drivers. Consequently, they tend to look at fewer sources of information. Alcohol creates a narrowing of the attention field beginning at approximately what percent BAC? A, 0. 0.50, B, 0. 0.04, C, 100%. Oh, uh, I'm going to hazard a guess that the right answer is B, 0. 0.04%. Okay, now that was a given. <laughs> okay, one last question in this category. Alcohol-impaired drivers tend to concentrate on what? becoming less vigilant with respect to safety information. And this divided attention happens as low as 0.02% BAC. What do they concentrate on instead of safety info? A, the words to who let the... No, no, uh, don't do it. No, no. no. <laughs> no. All right, all right. Uh, B, uh, books on tape, C, steering, or D, billboards. Steering. They concentrate on steering instead of stop signs and yield signs. I am so proud of you, panelists. You're doing great. We aim to please. Mm -hmm. Now, all of you know that driving under the influence is dangerous, but there are, of course, legal ramifications, too. And now it's time to discuss those. What's the open container law, uh, Tony? N now, why would you ask me? <laughs> oh, because you look so wise. You do look wise. Okay, well, let's see. It's illegal to possess an open container of an alcoholic beverage in a passenger area of a car that's on a public highway. Okay. And if I remember correctly, that's the deal whether or not it's being actually driven. I don't think so. I think it has to be moving. Actually, Kathy's right. It's against the law whether the vehicle is being operated, stopped, or parked. And if you're convicted of this offense, you could be fined up to $500. Possession of an alcoholic beverage increases the minimum term of confinement by six days for the first offense. So if somebody is arrested or, or whatever for intoxication, does that include both alcohol and drugs? Yep. Texas is a state with a 10-year washout period, also known as a look-back period. Now, this means that a prior conviction is not admissible after 10 years. Now, if it's 10 years in one day since the driver was convicted of a DUI, that driver will be considered a first-time offender. If a driver commits a DUI within 10 years of the first DUI, he or she is considered guilty of a second offense and is subjected to harsher punishments. So the first DWI, a drunk driving conviction, is a misdemeanor. Right. Now, who can tell me the penalties for first DWI, drunk driving conviction, in Texas? Well, a fine of up to $2,000. Mm -hmm, correct. What about jail time? Oh, I don't know how long. Uh, not long enough, whatever it is. I think it's... 72 hours up to 240 days in jail. Actually, 72 hours is right, but it's only 180 days. Oh, well, I wouldn't say only about 180 days in the slammer. <laughs> Good point. Now, what about the driver's license? How long will it be suspended? I think it's a long time, like a month. No, wait, longer, 90 days? I think it can be as long as a whole year. Oh, God. You think right. 90 days to one year driver's license suspension. Can you imagine how hard that would be to get to a job or get your kids to school? And it gets worse. 
You can also have a possible ignition interlock restriction and an SR-22 insurance requirement. What's an SR-22? Oh, sorry. It and an FR-44 are certificates of financial responsibility mandated by the state and provided by your auto insurance company that verifies you have auto insurance liability coverage. Got it. Ouch. It's worse on the second DWI drunk driving conviction. Yes, ma'am. It's a misdemeanor still, but the penalty for a second one is up to $4,000 fine, 30 days to one year in jail, six months to two years, driver's license suspension. How would you even get to the grocery store? Mm -hmm. And again, possible ignition interlock restriction and SR-22 insurance requirement. Now, does anybody know about the third DWI drunk driving mm -hmm. conviction? This is a felony, right? Anybody know what happens to you? I'm glad to say I don't. <laughs> well, here's the bad news, or actually the good news, if you like safe roads with no drunk drivers on them. A third DWI felony can get you up to $10,000 fine, two to ten years in jail, and up to two years driver's license suspension and possible ignition interlock restriction. So don't say we didn't warn you. <laughs> Isn't there a special DWI if you have a kid in the car? Oh, yes. It's a felony to drive while intoxicated with a minor under the age of 15 in the vehicle, so don't do any of this stuff. Zero tolerance. Now, what does that mean exactly, and is it a law, or is it a way that school principals behave, or just what? Well, I'm glad you asked me that, because believe it or not, that's the next topic I want to discuss. I swear I didn't know. And I believe you. Now, here's the skinny. 1997, the Texas legislature passed a zero tolerance law for minors, anyone under 21 years of age. This law says that even if a minor is not intoxicated, as defined by the DWI statute, if the minor has any detectable amount of alcohol in his or her system while driving in a public place, the minor has committed the criminal offense of driving under the influence of alcohol by a minor. On September 1, 2009, this law was expanded to include watercraft in addition to cars, trucks, and SUVs, and there are very specific consequences. Okay, let's take turns reading them so our traffic offenders can hear some different voices. Uh, <laughs> Kathy, take the first one. My pleasure. Okay, it's a Class C misdemeanor if a minor drives under the influence of alcohol. The first time, the consequences include a fine of up to $500, attendance at an alcohol awareness class, 20 to 40 hours of mandatory community service, and 60 days driver's license suspension. The minor would not be eligible for an occupational license for the first 30 days. Thank you, Mrs. Whiteman. Uh, Tony, second offense. This is also a Class C misdemeanor, but it's punishable by a fine of up to $500, attendance in an alcohol awareness class at the judge's discretion, 40 to 60 hours of mandatory community service, and 120 days driver's license suspension. The minor would not be eligible for an occupational license for the first 90 days. Here, give me that third offense. It's not eligible for deferred adjudication. The minor's driver's license is suspended for 180 days, and an occupational license may not be obtained for the entire suspension period. If the minor is 17 years or older, the fine increases from $500 to $2,000, plus going to jail, not pass and go, for up to 180 days, or both. Thank you all for your assistance. It is possible that a minor could be arrested for DWI from drinking a non-alcoholic beer like O'Doul's or Sharp's which contain up to 0.05% alcohol. Any age can purchase these near beers without an ID. So you can see this is very serious business, especially for kids. I think it has to be. We should also discuss what happens if a driver refuses to submit to a chemical test in Texas and implied consent laws are enforced. And like DUI offenses, the penalties get worse as it happens. Now let me explain. In Texas, if the accused refuses to take a chemical test of their blood, breath, or urine, their driver's license will be suspended or revoked. Also, in addition to the penalties for DUI, the first chemical test refusal can get you 180 days driver's license suspension. The second and any subsequent refusals can get the driver two years license suspension if within 10 years of a DWI arrest. What about combining alcohol with other substances like drugs, over-the-counter, or prescription? I know of kids who have had real problems behind the wheel or not. It seems like alcohol just makes everything worse. Right, you are. There's even a term for it. It's called synergistic effects. and basically means the capacity for two or more drugs acting together. The combined effect is more intense than the separate effects combined. Kind of like that whole, the sum is greater than the sum of the parts, or 
or whatever that saying is. <laughs> what would we do without you to clarify everything for us, Judy? <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah, unfortunately I do. And you're right. Okay, let's break this down drug by drug, okay? Now hang on, kids. This is going to be a little tedious, but it's important to discuss these different drugs and what can happen. Are you ready? Oh, sure, I guess. I'm bring mm-hmm. on. Okay. The most dangerous thing to mix with a sedative, and that's alcohol, is another sedative or a downer. The combination can lead to extreme depression of the central nervous system and can be fatal. Now, what about acid or LSD? Uh, do we remember LSD from our scary films we saw in junior high? Oh, man, I remember those films. I hadn't thought about them in a long time. But I do know that when LSD is combined with alcohol, there's a weird reaction. The visible hallucinations that come with the trip often decrease. And so the user finds himself able to drink more alcohol than normal without feeling as drunk and messed up. That's crazy. It is crazy, but she's right. What about cocaine or crack? What happens when you mix that with alcohol? Who would be stupid enough to do that? Oh, you'd be surprised. I have no idea what happens. When people mix cocaine and booze, they're basically upping the danger that each drug poses. But worse, without knowing it, they're forming a complex chemical experiment within their bodies. Cocaine abuse coupled with the use of alcohol leads to more impulsive decision-making and to poor performance. But can't you have seizures with cocaine? Sure can. Uh, Dehydration and seizures. Don't do it, boys and girls. Next drug, ecstasy or MDMA. Whoa, no. Don't tell me there are actually geniuses out there combining ecstasy with tequila. I (laughs) wish I could say no, but there are. Heaven help us. And it's bad. Alcohol (laughs) combined with ecstasy can be very dangerous because of dehydration. One of the primary dangers in taking either of these drugs by themselves is that dehydration could be dangerous. So... Obviously, together, the risk is even higher. Also, MDMA decreases the body's ability to regulate its own temperature, and alcohol can raise body temperature, increasing the chances of death by hypertension. This is starting to upset me. Well, it is upsetting, but we're hopefully teaching some would-be users the dangers that are involved. For instance, with GHB. What is that? I've never even heard of that drug. We didn't have it in Mesquite. Well, it's called the date rape drug. Users add it to alcoholic drinks because it causes blackout periods to the person who accidentally drinks it. GHB is a depressant and is really dangerous when used together with alcohol. The combination of the two can slow respiration and heart rate to a dangerous level. I hate to bring this up, but what about heroin? I know we don't want to think anybody's actually using heroin, but it's Uh, out there, whether we like it or not. And it's worse combined with alcohol. The heroin high is characterized by depression of the central nervous system, and an overdose breathing completely stops. So it's very dangerous to drink alcohol while using heroin because the compounded effect of the CNS depressant can make an overdose even more likely. Wait, what initials did you just use? Oh, CNS, central nervous system. Got it. But why are we jumping to all these hardcore drugs when the biggest problem is probably marijuana? Don't you think more people combine alcohol and pot than alcohol and heroin? What are the dangers there? That's a very good point. It's very common and has some different bad risks. Like, for instance, smoking pot can suppress the drinker's sensation of nausea or needing to vomit, making overdose more possible. When a person is drunk enough that alcohol poisoning is a concern, their body needs to vomit. To get it out of them. Exactly. So when pot suppresses the instinct of vomit, the excess alcohol stays in the system, overdose is even more likely. But even if that's not a concern, like if the person hasn't really had enough to make him need to throw it up, doesn't marijuana affect concentration or slow down reaction times or something? Sure. Even typical social doses of marijuana can affect the user's concentration and judgment and the sensory and perceptual skills needed to be a good driver. Well, I hate to keep bringing up new kinds of drugs, but wouldn't speed be next after pot as far as being common? Mm, I'm not sure if it's officially the runner-up drug, but it surely is dangerous. The use of methamphetamine or speed with alcohol won't counteract the effects of the speed, but merely masks the effects. And this is dangerous because the user will be less aware of the effect that the drug is having on his body. So you're saying that even though the high is lessened, the physical effects such as the heart rate aren't. So the user's sense of when his or her body needs to stop will be skewed. Exactly. Next, mushrooms. Mushrooms? That's a pizza topping. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) There aren't any known dangerous physical interactions between alcohol and mushrooms, but they're unpredictable. So mixing them with anything makes them even more so. So don't do it. Right. Don't do it. 
What's the most dangerous drug you can combine with alcohol? Mm, the most dangerous substances to mix with booze are PCP and Special K with alcohol or other sedatives. The combination can absolutely kill you. Although using alcohol with other CNS, which means what, Kathy? Central nervous system. Yeah, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Using alcohol with other depressants and narcotics compound the depression of the CNS and can be fatal. These include heroin, but also morphine, opium, and barbiturates. I've heard different things about mixing alcohol with prescription drugs. I guess most of them have warnings on their labels. Most of them do. But a good rule of thumb is that since alcohol and antihistamines, for example, affect one another additively, they shouldn't be taken together. And that means they make the effects of each other stronger, right? Yes. And that could lead to overdose. Got it. Okay. I'm going to give you a list of anti-infection drugs now. So if you drink while taking any of these, it can lead to a rapid heart rate, nausea, and liver damage. These include Mandol, Cefabid, Cefetan, Feroxanine, INH, Flagella, Metrocal, Prostat, and Moxum. What about drugs like Antivan? Drugs like Antivan, such as Equestragesic, Aquanil, Miltown, Cerex, Centrax, Dorel, Restoril, or Halcyon can cause dizziness, forgetfulness, coma, and heart failure when used with alcohol. Also, barbiturates are dangerous. Is that like Secanol? Yes, yeah, Secanol, Amitol, Butasol, Nimbutol, Luminol, Pentothol, they're all CNS depressants. Combining them with booze can lead to dizziness, forgetfulness, coma, and death. Oh, please stop. This is scaring me. I know. It's scaring me, too. But think of the people we could be reaching who might not otherwise have thought to question these combinations, especially if a doctor prescribed the drug. Yeah, you're right. Okay, moving on to benzodiaphanines. Oh, man. Drinking alcohol while taking benzodiaphanine sleeping medication is detrimental because it can increase drowsiness, decrease normal breathing, and result in a coma. What about Elevil? I know some people who are taking that for a variety of reasons. Well, antidepressant drugs such as Elevil, Endep, Adipin, and Sinequan will increase the intoxicating effects of alcohol, so caution should be used. Now, here's one that you should never mess around with because it can have a deadly reaction in some cases. Have you panelists ever heard about MAO inhibitors. That's, um, oh, they're antidepressants, right? Exactly. Antidepressants that are MAO inhibitors have a deadly reaction when mixed with chemical tyramine, which is found in some wines and beers. The mixture causes a release of a neurotransmitter, uh, I think it's norepinephrine, right? Excellent. Which can cause a dramatic rise in blood pressure, leading to brain hemorrhage and death in extreme cases. God, I need an antidepressant after hearing about all these potentially life-threatening combo packs. Well, we're almost through with the list, I promise. Give me that list. I'm going to take a turn. Mm -hmm. Now, boys and girls, we're talking about narcotics. Mixing alcohol with narcotic drugs like Dilaudid. Am I saying that right? I believe so. Okay. That combination can result in increased intoxication, coma, and death. The effect of combining a narcotic and alcohol is synergistic. Okay, class. Now for a discussion of sedatives, anti-anxiety, and or sleep medications such as Xanax, Tecanol, Amitol, Butasol, Nimbutol, Notec, Librium, Valium, Prosom, Dalmon, and Transine. When combined with alcohol, these drugs can lead to dizziness, forgetfulness, coma, and death. So don't mess around with this stuff. That is the message of the day. Next... Tagamet. What? I've taken Tagamet for stomach trouble, I think. Well, proceed with caution, because Tagamet, which is, yes, a gastrointestinal drug, will increase the body's blood alcohol level, making overdose or alcohol poisoning more likely. What will I hear next? <laughs> well, you will hear that the heart drug, Verapamil, may increase intoxication when mixed with alcohol. Oh, please, can this be the end of the drug alcohol fright fest? <laughs> <laughs> it is the end of the list, and thank you, Kathy, for your assistance. My pleasure. I want to ask something. What about countermeasures? You know, like you hear that taking a cold shower or drinking black coffee or exercising will sober a, po a person up. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because guess what? Not true. Only time, the body weight, and the number of drinks and how much has been eaten really affect how long it takes for someone to sober up. I've heard it takes about an hour for the body to get rid of each drink. Pretty much. If a person has had more than one drink an hour, 
One hour of sobering up time should be allowed for each extra drink. Or better yet, go find that designated driver who's sitting in the corner watching everybody act like idiots and get her to give you a ride. (laughs) (laughs) Panel, that concludes our summary about alcohol and also concludes this class. You have one last video you will take and one last quiz to finish the course. You also have the opportunity to tell us what you think of the course and evaluate us. Your certificate will be mailed to you unless you chose to have it sent overnight. And thanks for your assistance, and please drive safely. And I want to thank our wonderful panel one more time, Mr. Tony Ramirez. Yay, thank you Tony. so much. Yay. It's always a pleasure to be a part of such a sexy panel. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, lovely are. and talented <laughs> Kathy Whiteman. Oh, it's always a pleasure to work with you guys. Uh-huh. The remarkably talented writer, Miss Judy Truesdale. Thank you, thank you. It was Ms. fun. It was fun. Mr. Microphone and crew, Jeff. Yay. <laughs> Well, you made it through the last section and only a short video and a few more quiz questions left to do. We sincerely hope you enjoyed the freedom of this course and that you had a laugh or two along the way. We tried to make it as easy as possible to take and hope you found it entertaining. A great cast is worth repeating and this was a great cast. We posted their biographies and pictures on the web so that you can see the faces behind the voices. A big thank you to Judy Truesdale, Kathy Whiteman, Tony Ramirez, and our special guest host Chuck Sheffield, and a very special walk-on cameo by the great Miss Jensen Truesdale. Jensen graciously stepped into the role of Mrs. Fry, the PTA member, and like the professional she is, nailed her role in one take. The script was written by Miss Judy Truesdale from the Wireless Defensive Driving.com curriculum. That was a challenge that Judy embraced and did a wonderful job. Thank you, Judy. Another special thank you goes to Jeff Collins for spending countless hours in the studio to make this all flow smoothly. Jeff composed the original music for the course and played all the instruments. He also was the producer, engineer, editor, gaffer, and responsible for all the taping and sound. Call our office if you need any of the above, and we'll get you in touch with Jeff. I'm Microphone, and it's been a pleasure. Thank you for choosing WirelessDefensiveDriving.com. If you enjoyed the course, please tell your friends. If you didn't, please tell us. We would appreciate it if you would like us on Facebook. Until next time, from the Terabyte Theater in downtown cyberspace, this has been WirelessDefensiveDriving.com. Alcohol. It's a legal substance, and a lot of people use it. So what if you get a little buzz? A little buzz never hurt anybody, right? The truth is, the use of alcohol, as well as the abuse of it, can cause harmful effects on your body, which in turn directly affects your behavior. Now these effects obviously can reveal themselves after many years of repeated abuse. And did you know that they can also happen on a first-time basis? In this program, we will investigate how the use and abuse of alcohol affects your behavior and look at the potential short-term and long-term effects this drug has on your body. The first thing we need to do is to take a brief look at the brain so that we can get a better feeling for where alcohol goes to work. Then we'll see what changes the drug brings about in the brain. We'll also examine how these changes alter your behavior. As you can see, The brain is made up of a series of grooves, or what we call fissures. The neural tissue between a set of grooves is called a gyrus. These gyri are made up of nerve cells, or neurons, which take in information and then send the information either to other areas of the brain or out to the muscle, resulting in a behavior. One might consider the brain to be a machine that transmits information. How well it communicates that information to other areas of the body will determine the types of behavior you will exhibit. An individual neuron generally takes in information through these structures, called dendrites, and accumulates that information in the cell body. After making a decision as to what to do, the neuron sends that information down this long tube called an axon. 
This information is in the form of an electrical impulse and can only occur if ions can get in and out of the axon through the cell membrane. If these ions cannot pass in or out, then you have short-circuited the system and no message will be sent. Now let's talk about alcohol. The three most common types include methanol, isopropyl, and ethanol. Although all are dangerous and potentially deadly, methanol distilled from wood products has a very high probability of causing blindness in small doses and even death in moderately higher doses. Isopropyl, or rubbing alcohol, is a very common type of alcohol. When manufactured, this type of alcohol is mixed with acetone, wood alcohols, or hydrocarbons, making it equally as dangerous as wood alcohol. The substances in rubbing alcohol are toxic and lead to death in small doses. It is important to use this alcohol only as it is intended. Ethanol, distilled from grains, is found in beer, wine, and distilled beverages, and is the type of alcohol most often abused. When ethanol is present in the brain, it disrupts the flow of activity within a single neuron. In simple terms, the membrane of the cell swells, making it difficult for ions to move in and out of the neuron. This is an effect that we call fluidization of the membrane. The result is that information that needs to be sent to different regions of the brain for processing and to bring about behavior just can't get to those areas. The behavioral effects that alcohol will have on your body depend upon the amount of alcohol you have consumed. First, let's look at the short-term or acute effects of this potent drug. Even though alcohol is categorized as a sedative hypnotic, small doses cause an actual increase in behaviors, a loss of inhibitions, and impaired judgment. You know what this means. All of a sudden, a person starts acting in ways not normal for him or her, either because that behavior is socially unacceptable, dangerous, or even unlawful. The one thing is certain. There will be regrets the next morning. As if that isn't enough, as more and more alcohol enters your system, other things start to go wrong. Did you know that even with blood levels of alcohol well below the legal limits, that drowsiness may set in, or you'll experience times of delayed reaction, or you may find it difficult to pay attention. At these levels, your ability to perform complex tasks, tasks which require inputs from several different senses, becomes severely impaired. The combination of these factors can often lead to serious and even deadly results. Okay, so maybe you're the smart one and you don't drink and drive. You certainly won't have to face mom and dad down at the police station to explain what happened. But does this mean that you can drink all you want and not have to worry? After all, you're not driving. Well, let me tell you, there are worries involved. So you need to have all the information that you can get to help you make that decision. Even if you're not the driver and you drink heavily, there are many risks of which you may not be aware. High levels of alcohol in your blood will create serious problems. You may start to have gray outs, where you have difficulty recalling things you did while you were drinking. The memory may be there, but you just can't get to it. More serious are events known as blackouts. In this case, the memories aren't even laid down, and you'll never have any idea as to what happened. While you were under the influence of alcohol, you won't remember where you were or what you did. Hey, guys. Um, we'll talk about this later. What is wrong with people today? Everybody's been giving me the strangest look. And I feel horrible. It doesn't help when people are being so rude. Rude? You don't even remember how you acted last night? I remember what? If I were you, I'd fall under a rock for like 30 years. Not only is it embarrassing, but you could be so vulnerable that you make yourself defenseless against someone who might take advantage of you. Every year during parties and annual festivities, peer pressure causes us to take part in drinking competitions. You know, like struggle-lugging, where we drink a lot of alcohol really quickly. Most of us know that this is not a good idea, so we do it anyway just to 
prove ourselves or to fit in with the crowd. Now we don't think about it, but this can lead to one of the most dangerous aspects of short-term alcohol use, acute alcohol poisoning. When you up a bottle, your blood alcohol level increases dramatically. The toxin gets into your brain almost immediately and large numbers of brain cells begin to shut down. You may become comatose and death may occur instantaneously for very high blood alcohol levels or as long as 16 hours later for slightly lower levels. The body's natural defense against this situation is to get the alcohol out of the system by throwing up. This is a very effective way for the body to protect itself. However, there is a problem that must be considered. Marijuana is an antiemetic. This means that it prevents the body from ridding itself of toxins. If you smoke marijuana while drinking, you are blocking your body's natural defense mechanism to protect you from further absorption. This last point brings up the issue of dealing with the person who has passed out from drinking too much. What should you do? Conventional wisdom is to let the person sleep it off. Letting the person sleep it off might be all right sometimes. The problem is, is that when there's a high level of alcohol in the person's stomach, it'll continue to rise and the person's blood alcohol level can get dangerously high. So even though the person may be peacefully asleep or appear to be sound asleep, the person in fact could die later on. Another scary thing to remember is that even though you may be asleep, the alcohol in your system could cause you to get sick and throw up. Now, this means that if a person is lying there sound asleep, he could in fact choke on his own vomit, and this certainly wouldn't be a pleasant way to go. Now, it's your choice, but you can't treat it lightly. There are dangers involved with alcohol abuse. Once your body is ravaged by this drug, you can't repair it. Most of the problems associated with alcohol center around the long-term or chronic use. Alcohol is an addictive drug, meaning that stopping the drug will lead to withdrawal symptoms. Minor symptoms include reactions such as agitation and tremors, muscle cramps, nausea and vomiting, and irregular heartbeat. These symptoms may last for up to two days. The major symptoms are much more serious and last up to a week. They include increasing agitation, disorientation, confusion, and hallucinations. When we say hallucinations, we're not talking about the fun, dreamlike, cuddly bunny rabbit type. They're more like the kind that are your worst nightmare. It really is a terrifying experience. Furthermore, stopping alcohol cold turkey quite often will lead to seizures. Death occurs in a substantial number of these individuals when this happens. This is why it's so important to seek medical attention even before trying to kick the habit. Chronic use of alcohol can lead to a variety of other problems. First of all, the drug results in a reduction in blood flow to the brain. With less oxygen and fewer nutrients, there is damage directly to neurons and the supporting cells which supply nutrients to those nerve cells. This can eventually lead to the neurons actually being starved to death. Alcohol also acts as a desiccant, drying out the tissues. The net result of all these effects is a widening of the grooves of the brain and an enlargement of the ventricles which carry fluids throughout the brain. Out in the periphery of the body, away from the brain, damage also can be seen. The most common side effect is buildup of fat and scar tissue in the liver and the heart, conditions commonly known as cirrhosis of the liver and alcoholic cardiomyopathy. This weakens both organs and causes them not to function properly, if at all. There is also the problem of cancer. If you drink over a considerable amount of time, you will increase dramatically your chances of having cancer of the mouth, throat, and liver. Worse though is the interaction of alcohol with tobacco. When you smoke or chew while you drink, alcohol can act as a solvent for the carcinogens in the tobacco. This allows them to pass more easily into the gums, 
lips, and throat. These increases are absolutely dramatic. Alcohol also interferes with bone marrow. Thus, it lowers your body's defenses and leads to a condition called alcoholic anemia. In addition to being tired all the time, you get bleeding ulcers because there aren't enough platelets to form clots. This means you can actually bleed to death. Behaviorally, long-term alcohol use leads to something called Korsakoff syndrome. This is a condition which produces a severe loss of cognitive abilities, including amnesia of past events and the inability to learn and remember new material. Individuals suffering from Korsakoff syndrome are disoriented, have hallucinations, and engage in muttering delirium. Unfortunately, in alcohol-induced Korsakoffs, there is no recovery, and these individuals are forced to live out their lives in a state of psychosis, with no memory of the past and no ability to learn from the present. There is one other aspect of alcohol abuse for women to consider, and that is drinking while pregnant. If you drink alcoholic beverages while you are carrying a child, you can produce an effect called fetal alcohol syndrome. After a drink, the drug quickly crosses the placental barrier, enters the baby's brain, and causes irreversible damage. If you choose to drink while you are pregnant, your baby may be born with a low birth weight, odd facial characteristics such as drooping eyelids, small eyes, a misshapen mouth, a high forehead, and the malformation of various organs. Later on, your baby will show poor coordination, a slowed growth rate, and mental retardation. And what's the child to do? Your child didn't choose to drink. You did. Life is tough enough as it is, so give your child a good start and don't drink. Although the situation we just discussed is a huge problem, it is not the only situation in which alcohol abuse affects others. On a day-to-day -day basis in my household, I always wondered what was going to happen next, what disaster was going to happen, what, how was he going to feel that day, was it going to be a good day or a bad day, how much was he going to drink that night, and it was always a guessing game of what my life would be like on a day-to-day -day basis. He won't see me get married. He won't meet the man I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. He won't see me have my children. And it just makes me very angry that he's going to miss out on all that because it's, it's something that he could have controlled. Now is the time to consider. Should I or shouldn't I? Nobody's going to force you to drink. The decision is entirely yours. And you should be aware of the consequences on your body, your brain, and your behavior. If you feel you may have a problem with alcohol, contact your school counselor, your regional mental retardation facility, or your local chapter of Alcoholics Anonymous.